to uh, study your word. God, thank you for the break um, from the study that you've allowed me to have to kind of uh, just be able to um, have a to be able to kind of refocus in many ways and be able to be able to realign myself. Um, and Lord, just have a, a certain amount of weight. Not that this is a burden, but it is a responsibility, God. So thank you for raising up uh, the men that you have to help in that regard uh, with me. Lord, I thank you that that has been able to afford me a bit of rest. So God, I just I just give tonight over to you. Uh, speak through me. Uh, speak your word uh, and allow it uh, allow its power to speak to each of us, God. May we be uh, emboldened and and uh, and um, inflamed uh, by what your word says tonight, God. Uh, God, just open each of our hearts and make us receptive tonight. Uh, give me clarity of the, of speech and thought. Uh, and God, may you get the glory for tonight. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right. Now, I don't. I don't even have the link to the wherever. Normally, Kess is on that. So, <laughs> if you can't tell, I am very out of sorts. Speaking of speaking of Kess, uh, <laughs> Kess, you're only allowed in here if you promise not to steal my notes. No promises. I I believe that. All right. All right. So I know it's been a while since we've been in Nehemiah. Does anybody remember, you know, what's going on, where we're at, what's what, what, just kind of sum up where we're at in Nehemiah so far? Thank you, but th that's great. But what happened leading up to chapter eight? What's been the major activity that we were, that we were, <sighs> I do not have, I, I, I am not able to deal with this tonight, guys. What's, what's been the major plot of, of Nehemiah up to this point? Restoration of what? It's not a trick question. This is this is crazy. The wall. Yeah. Yeah, we were going to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. So Nehemiah, he gets some bad news back in chapter one. He prays about it for three months. Talks to the king. King's like, okay, go. So he goes back, encounters a little bit of, you know, of trouble. He deals with it. And the and how long does it take him to build the wall? You guys remember? How long did they spend? 52 days, exactly. 52 days. The wall goes up. And it's a huge victory for the people of God. And there's this, there's this, you know, just all, all the enemies that were, uh, uh, that were, that were against God's people. They were very disheartened, and 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 they were like, oh, that that had to have been done by God. That's literally how the Bible puts it. And says they 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 realized that this was obviously a work of God, uh, for them to have completed it in this amount of time with the, with everything that was against them. So then in chapter 7, we have this list, this list that we've seen before. It seems very familiar from uh, the book of Ezra, which we just studied. And now we come to chapter 8. We finish chapter 7, and the very last section, the very last little, little verb, uh, sentence in chapter 7, seven it says that all, or when the seventh month had come, people of Israel in their towns. Okay? And so... We have people kind of in there. The walls are built. In it, am I going erotic? Am, am I am I going off? Ah, 
Let me know when it's back. Internet, I really need you to behave now. <laughs> I'm going to be honest, guys. I didn't want to leave this comp. I literally waited until I to leave. <laughs> so I know I'm starting late, but all right. So bearing that in mind, with, with all the stuff, we feel like the plot's over, right? We built the wall. We're done, right? Apparently not. Can I get someone to read those verses? Yes, the first two verses of chapter eight. I can't. Thank you. Go ahead. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. Um, so Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. Now this is interesting. So we finished building the wall, and it and it end of chapter seven says that the seventh month has come, and the people of Israel are all in their towns, and then they all gather in Jerusalem in the square before the water gate. And, and just look at the way that the the, the the Bible phrases this. It says all the people gather as one man. They all. As, just like as one mind, like a hive mind almost. They come into the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe. The, the, do you see that? They told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. This is the people asking Ezra to bring out the book. What is going on here? Explain, Doc. I will move around in my chair so it's not simply dead noise as we're waiting for Doc to type out his answer. Doc is making some interesting connections. Hezekiah is one, but there's actually another king of Judah we're going to mention that we can tie this passage to. Yep, Kess is on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Josiah. Absolutely. Yep. We see people clamoring for the word of God. What do you call that? What would be a term that if you hear people asking, you know, for to, to read the Bible, they're, they're, they're actively wanting to learn about God and, ha and, and read the Bible, have the Bible read and explained to them. What would you call that? 
is there a word that would describe that? If it hadn't been property for a very long time and all of a sudden it is, what do you call that? There we go. Revival. God's moving. God's up to something. We got the we, we've got the people. We we have them in place. Because remember, it's been a while since we've seen Ezra. You know, he's back. So that brings up another question. Where the heck has Ezra been? I mean, Ezra was was kind of this major figure in the last book. The book's named after him. Where's he been? That's a prevailing thought, Yes. Yeah, it, a lot of what the commentaries that I read said that uh, after the events of Ezra, he went back to Persia for a while, leaving somebody else in charge. And that's kind of what leads to some of the conditions that Nehemiah describes in the governorship in prior chapters. But now he's here. He's come back. So the thought was, the, I saw this in a couple of commentaries, was that it looked like Ezra went back for 12 to 15 years of time span that he returned to Persia. And he comes back hearing about the news that, that Nehemiah, uh, all the work had been done there. He travels uh, back to Jerusalem and he gets there and the people are like, we have a scribe, this guy who knows the law and has it. We haven't had this for a while, but you know, we have this guy in Nehemiah who's all about prayer and all about serving God and he's and he's helping us get our hearts right, but now we have this guy who knows and understands and we know from the last book that he wants to teach others the law of God. He's here in our midst. Let's get him to do the things that he wants to do. How cool is that? It's almost like God was orchestrating something. Oh my goodness, this is Sisso. Hi, brother. Sisso, you're gonna you 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 gonna get ready because because scribe is scribe is fired tonight. That missions conference got him got him hyped up. Cool. Anyways. Bible study I've already started. Yeah, yeah, we're we're underway. <laughs> Oh, okay. I just, I was at a stoplight and finally could, like, log in. <laughs> All right. So, we've got, we've got signs of revival, and we have the return of Ezra. And so, they, the people are like, hey, Ezra, why don't you come, you know, read the, read the law to us. And so Ezra is like, okay, and gets the law, and he brings it out before everybody, before all the men and the women, and everybody who could understand. Now, pay attention to that word. Ceso, so could you mute your mic? Because you keep popping up every time you move your phone. Can you hear now? I, yeah, I can, st I can still hear you, yeah. <laughs> One I can't do it in drive. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I'll just, I'll server mute you. Okay, thanks. Yep. That's part of it, Doc. Um, what, one of the thoughts is that the, the term uses, or the Bible uses some, uh, some language, and we'll come to it a little bit later, um, that, you know, people have been living in Persia for 70 years or within the Persian Empire, but part of that, they were also living in Babylon. 
And across the empire, there were different dialects and such. So if you lived in, in Babylon, you could there would be like the Chaldee dialect. But if you were closer to Persia, you would be in the you know, more of the Assyrian. Uh, uh, and so there were there were different languages and such. And so if you were born there, you might know what was you know pervasive in that area. But when you returned, the law that Ezra has was not written in Assyrian or Chaldee. It's written in Hebrew. And so there have to be certain uh, measures taken to help out. But that's not what I mean by understand. The, term, the word understand appears a few times in, uh, in, this, in chapter 8. And it's an important word. So I want you guys to pay attention and just look for it. All right? Just, just keep your eyes out for that word. All right, so that's the first two verses. I got to fly because, you know, I, oof, we have got stuff. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's go down to so – let's go through there. Can I get someone to read those verses? There are names. I apologize, but they're, they're not too bad. Go ahead, Cass. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Maasiah on his right hand, and Padiah, Mishael, Malchijah, Hashem, Hash. Badana, Zechariah, and Meshulam on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Oh, this is Nehemiah chapter 8. Is one of my favorite chapters. This chapter is just, it's just amazing. All right. So Ezra goes, and he's like, let's, let's read. And so it says that from early morning until midday. How early is early morning? Yeah, that's literally what the Bible means. It literally means daylight. <laughs> when the sun comes up, he goes. <laughs> so what? what's happening here is that pretty much for six hours, Ezra and these guys that are with him, they're, they're alternate off because, you know, I don't know if you know this, but reading for six hours out loud gets rough on the voice. So what is likely happening is that, ne or not Nehemiah, Ezra has these other guys with him. And when one guy's voice starts to get tired or after a set amount of time, they will switch off and the next guy will start to read. Now, notice that Ezra is not just, isn't just reading. He is reading from a platform. It says that he was standing on a wooden platform. Do you notice anything interesting about this wooden platform? Yes! Oh my goodness! They this wooden platform the, in the in the literal in the original language it literally means like a tower, probably an aggressive term, but it but it's the idea that it's a raised platform. Uh, it, 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 it's it's be the crap that you up and this person basically like be that's what it is. But it is sit for this purpose. This isn't just like, oh we have this you know pre built we were using it for something else we can use it for this no they built this so that Ezra can stand above the people and give the law to them. That's okay. God can work through my internet. The theme of the missions conference is God is able. God can work through my crap internet. All right?
Oh, so good. Not only do we see you know God starting to move, we see the people responding. They're, 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 they have they have physical preparations made for for the movement of revival. You know, it's not just you know oh revival God God wants to do something. Well, let's sit back and wait for him. It's like no, God's wanting to move. Let's do stuff to to let him move. Make it easier. And so we've got this platform. It's holding 14 people up on this platform. Ezra and his 13, his 13 closest friends. Or whoever they were. <laughs> Some of their names are mentioned uh, in other passages. More than likely, they were Levites. And so they would have been have some familiarity with the law. And as it says, Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, because remember, he's standing up on a platform above them, so they could all just look up and be like, there's Ezra. And he and as he opened it, all the people stood. So originally they're sitting down. But when Ezra opens the scriptures. Well, the people stand in reverence. You ever done that in church? Everybody, you guys have ever had a, had a a preacher, your pastor, or you know, whenever you open the scriptures, you know, it's like, please stand for the reading of God's word. This is where you get that. Oh, it's so cool. In verse 6, it says, Ezra blessed the Lord. That is like, <laughs> when, we get to ch- when we get to chapter 9, um, we're going to find out exactly kind of, you know, that might be the, the understatement of the century. Uh, chapter 9 will expound upon how Ezra, quote, blesses the Lord. Um, but yeah, so we'll, we'll see that. And the idea of the great God, that is Nehemiah. Uh, that, that's kind of his way that he describes God. So that's his little narration there. And all the people answered, Amen. And they don't just say it once. They say it twice. Amen. Let it be so. May it be. And they lift up their hands in praise. Then they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. This is just after... Nehemiah, or Nehemiah, good gracious, Ezra, blessing the Lord. He's opened the book. He's blessed the Lord. And the people bow their heads and worship. (laughs) Hmm. This is amazing. I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit later, but just look at how responsive the people were. Their hearts were so ready. They, they built a platform for Ezra for the express purpose of him teaching them. And as he's just beginning going, remember, this is about six in the morning, you know, dawn. They're all gathered in the court of Jerusalem to listen to Ezra, teach them from the word of the Lord. And he opens the book and gives and blesses the Lord. And they all cry out, Amen! Amen! And then they worship. There are mornings where I wonder if I'm saved at 6 a.m. This is what the Jews are doing at 6 a.m. Gracious. Now, I'm going to take verses 7 and 8, because these are bonkers, and some of these names are, yeah. And I I don't want to subject you guys to that, so I'll take these. So, also, Jeshua, or Joshua, Bani, 
Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah. Uh, that's one that's split between lines. Let's go to the <laughs> Messiah. Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, and Peliah, the Levites. They are again. Helped the people to understand, is that word again, the law, while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. All right, so we talked about the whole language barrier. That This is kind of what that's talking about. There's this language barrier kind of thing, you know, going from Chaldee or Assyrian to Hebrew. That's part of this, but there's more. There's the idea of, look, do you know how long it's been since anybody's actually read this? Since anybody, since the people were taught, normally it was the priest's job to know the law. But the people, by and large, had been, you know, they didn't have access to it. And so now we have Ezra and the Levites passing down the knowledge of the law to the people. And, you know, if this is their exposure to it for the first time in, you know, 70, 70 years plus since uh, you know, since the uh, the exile, there's probably some explanations that need to be made. So these other guys that are named here, these Joshua, Bani, and all these guys, are helping to interpret and explain what the law means to the people. Both in language and in, you know, what some of the customs and things would have been. And as this is happening, we keep seeing that word, the whole concept of understanding. Things, you know, it, it's not just hearing the law. It's not just listening to some guy talk. There's a, there's a speaker. There's a listener. And then there's comprehension. There's an ascertaining of what's being said and the and like the uh, uh, like the, the the whole ideas and and I can't I'm having a hard time uh, describing it. But but basically they're getting it. Essentially, go back to high school and, you know, understanding a book the way that the teacher wants you to understand the book. That's what's happening. And this is exciting. This is cool. I'm not sure what you mean by that, D Ford. But if we're going to get onto the subject of the chosen elect, I am going to call that out for after hours because that this is that is a this isn't the time or place for that right now. We can tackle that a little bit later. <laughs> but hang on to that question because I I don't want to just leave it you know and just be like that never happened. So we can address that a little bit later. All right. Any questions so far? I haven't I haven't asked that. Correct. Okay. With that clear, can I get someone to take the next four verses?
I can wait. Are you waiting for someone to volunteer? Yes, please. <laughs> I will step up. Oh, wise raddies. What a legend. Thank you, sir. Uh, and Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy, do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, and to send portions, and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. Hmm. I think I saw that word again. And there in verse 12. All right. So after the first eight verses, you know, we have Ezra reading the law for like six hours. He and his, he and his buddies. They're reading the law, and then there and then there are these other guys, these Levites, who are helping to explain the law to all the people that are gathered in the court and listening. And so we come to verse nine, and we see the response of the people. What is the response of of the people uh, to the reading of the law? Whew. Weeping? I thought this was a happy chapter. <laughs> but this is why this is why understanding is so important. Because the people are hearing, you know, the law, and the law was what God expected and demanded of his people. A holy God's demands of the people that he has chosen and called out to represent him. And as they're listening and understanding, they are realizing how badly they have failed in upholding the law. Basically, my uh, if you go back, if you go over to, uh, to Isaiah 6. Uh, where Isaiah is in the temple and he sees the vision of the Lord, and he, and he says, "Woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips within an unclean nation," you know, sort of thing. Uh, my, I, I had a pastor who uh, who taught me like the actual Hebrew word of or the, like the Hebrew that that Isaiah says there, and it's literally, uh, "Uh oh, that's not true." Um, but that's essentially the idea. Isaiah is like, "Oh." I am beholding holiness, and I am so far beneath that, and that is what the people of Israel are encountering here. They are seeing the demands of holiness as God placed it to them, as he demanded it as uh, upon them, and they're like, we so did not do that. <laughs> and so there is this tremendous weeping, and there's th there's this just... This this general and complete mourning uh, over the depth and the and the totality of their sin, how badly they've missed the mark on living up to the standards set by their God. Completely justified, I might say. <laughs> the 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 response of the people in that moment is one hundred percent correct. Because when you when you see who God is and you see what your sin is, you should be broken over that. And the people were. 
But then they're told not that they're not allowed to weep. Why? If their response was correct and perfectly justified, why were they told not to weep? Why was the day holy, wise rat? And D Ford, yes, you're right as well. The conviction and recognition wow. <laughs> conviction and recognition leads to repentance. And those are necessary necessary steps. Ah, oh, Ciso on it. It was a day that they heard the law. Yes. We're touching on it. There's also kind of a coincidental one. This is cool. Because the seventh month of of the Hebrew calendar is touched upon. Yes, it is. <laughs> but it, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on this in a minute. But it's probably not known. That this day, the first day of the Jewish of, of the seventh month, is actually uh, set aside as a holy day. It, it, it's one of the feasts, one of the seven feasts. They, they might have read ahead, who knows? But it's not mentioned in Nehemiah, and kind of and, and the next bit kind of mentioned or kind of talks about how they stumbled upon this information. So it seems to me that they probably didn't know this. But the first day of the seventh month is actually supposed to be the Feast of Trumpets. If you flip over to uh, Leviticus chapter 23, it talks about it, it or like uh, it's talking about the feasts that are ordained by God um, during the Jewish calendar. And down in verse 23, you know, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, "Speak to the people of Israel, saying, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month." Coincidentally, that's that's where we're at over in Nehemiah chapter 8. You shall observe a day of solemn rest. A memorial proclaimed with a blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. Now, this day, the reason that Nehemiah and Ezra set aside this day and said, you know, don't weep because the people were, were experiencing revival. This, Yes, you are to be broken, but this is God reinstating and, and bringing his people back to himself. And look at verse 10. They said, go your way. Eat the fat, drink sweet wine, send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. That's a shout out. Remember the remember the callback. You know we we had the whole idea of you know the 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 rich the rich people living in Jerusalem, the rich Jews exercising all of this interest and this usury upon their their brothers who were unable to you know provide for themselves or they're having to send their kids in labor. They're like for those that don't have anything prepared, those that can't afford anything, send to them. You know, look out for those that can't uh, look uh, look out for themselves, that aren't able to. For this day is holy to our Lord, and don't be grieved. This last this last section right here, verse him. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. The people were broken about their sin. But that was the first step in returning to the joy of the Lord. 
The people were so hungry for God. It says, listen, this is God drawing you back to himself. Be joyful that he is finally bringing his people back to him. It just so happened in a <clears throat> coincidence that it fell on the day of the Feast of Trumpets. So that's just a fun little, you know, nugget to drop right there. Yeah, as I like to say, a coincidence is simply when God chooses to remain anonymous. So verse 12, after, after hearing all that, the people went their way to eat and drink and send portions and make great rejoicing. Because, why? They understood. All right, I'm not, I know I'm pressed up against 10 o'clock, and I don't want to keep you guys long. So I'm just going to throw like the remainder of the chapter, and we'll just read it all at once, okay? <laughs> if, if fish sticks or whatever is controlling all of this anymore will let me. Hey, somebody want to take that? Okay, hang on, Cecil. Let me unserve mute you. Okay. <laughs> All right, you're you unmuted. Me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. On the second day of the heads of the fathers' houses of all the people with the priests and the Levites came together to Ezra, the scribe, in order to study the word of the law. And they found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in the booths during the feast of the seventh month and that they should proclaim it and publish it in all of their towns and in Jerusalem, go out to the hills and bring branches of olives, wild olives, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees and make booths, as it is written. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof and in their courts and in their, wait, and in their courts and in their courts of the house of God and in the square at the water gate in in the square in the gate of the of Ephraim, and all the assembly of those who had returned from the captive captivity made booths and lived in the booths from for from the days of Jeshua the son of Nun to that day the people of Israel had not done so, and there was very great rejoicing. And day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. And kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day there was a solemn assembly according to the rule. Oh my gosh. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, I'm serious. This. Oh, this will make you tear up. <laughs> there is so much here that is just so beautiful. So, that. The last 12 verses we read, that was day one. Here we go. Verse 13, we start day two. <laughs> and the heads of the father's houses, so all the heads of the families now, with the priests and the Levites, they come to Ezra, and they're like, hey, can we study the Bible some more? That that okay with you? Meanwhile, Ezra, who had purposed in his heart to uh, know the law of the Lord, to know the commands of the Lord, to do them and to teach others, he's over here like, yeah, I'm good with that. So they start studying, and they're just reading through, and it happens that as they're going through, they stumble upon, wouldn't you know it, that chapter, chapter 23 in Leviticus we were talking about a little while ago, just a few verses later. 
Here's verse 33, or starting in verse 33 of Leviticus 23. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh month, and for seven days, is the Feast of Booths to the Lord. All right, I'm going to stop there. What the heck is a booth? We've seen this word a number of times, but what is the deal with a booth? Why do we keep using this term? Is this like a flea market? Okay, Cass has got it. It's a small structure that's meant to be temporary. It's not supposed to last long. Different versions will, call, will use different words. Uh, tabernacle is used. So on the first day shall be a holy convocation. You will not do any ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. Then on the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. So all these guys are like, they read that, and they look at the calendar, and they're like, all right, we're on the second day of the seventh month. God says right here, that on the 15th day of the seventh month, we're supposed to do this. Guys, you know what we should do? I think we should get ready to do this. And so, like, they send messages to, like, everywhere. They send messages out to all the people. They're like, okay, go get leaves. <laughs> go to these trees that are mentioned. Um uh, like the uh, like the, the the olive, the wild olive, myrtle, palm, all this stuff. These are these are typically trees that are understood to have like thick branches. They have a lot of leaves on. Them. They're very full. It's not like a pine where you just got like you know stuff kind of hiding, you know, hanging all over it, or just kind of like it doesn't really form a shelter. This is stuff where the foliage will be thick, so you can actually kind of make an actual enclosure or like be covered up. So they, they tell everybody, go out, start getting stuff, and the, and all the people do. They go out and they gather all these all these branches. Could you imagine what the forest looked like after this? <laughs> it was like all oh, the trees are like, oh, you know, the entire forestry industry is just like, oh man, every seventh month it's just, oh. Anyway, getting off track. <laughs> And so they come back to the city of Jerusalem and they build them on their roofs because the, the roofs in in those times, they didn't build houses the way we do like in America, you know, often with the pitched roof. The, the, the roofs were flat. And so you could go up on top of your roof, actually stand there and like build, you know, build this this booth out of out of you know tree branches. They didn't just build them there. They built them in the courts, uh, like in the open the open areas of the of the city they built them in in what were essentially like your yards like your backyard or the spaces between between homes they built them by the gate so that anybody visiting the city if they didn't actually have a home in the city they could hang out and use those booths and the people collectively on the whole were participating in this festival and the oh my gosh Oh my goodness, just verse 17. Are you kidding me? And all the assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booze and lived in the booze for seven days. You're supposed to just hang out in, in these in these tabernacles. These little these little you know leaf tents. For from the days of Jeshua, meaning Joshua, the son of Nun, to the day to that day, the people of Israel had not <laughs> The people of Israel had not done so. Okay. Since before the time of the judges, to a little over 400 years before Christ is born, This ha something like this hadn't happened. Now that's not to say that the that the festival or the feast of booze hadn't been happening. It had been. There were there are numerous uh, 
moments in the Old Testament where it's actually recorded that the uh, the Feast of Booze was was observed. What is the, so if that's the case, what does the Bible mean here that it's been since the days of Joshua? Since this has happened. Yes, exactly. It hasn't been observed so uh, so completely by all of Israel. There's so much in that. The, the one thing, the, the, one of the most beautiful things about that whole idea is that it's been how long since they've done this completely? And you just have the leaders, again, the leaders of each house get together with, with the religious guys, the, the, you know, the priests and the Levites and Ezra. They're all just you know, checking out the law. And they find this instruction from God saying, hey, uh, on, in the middle of this month, on the 15th day, I want you to do this. And they're like, you know how many hundreds of years it's been since we've done this? And they all kind of look at each other and they says, God says it. Let's do it. How hard was that? They had hundreds of years of traditionally not doing it. And then in this one moment, they look at it. They see that God says to do it and they decide to do it. This is revival in its purest sense. God says do it. They did it. <laughs> it's so simple, but it's so beautiful. Seventeen. I want to see it typed out or said. Oh, uh, did, did, did I go full Skynet? Oh, sorry. Try that again. End of verse 17. The, that's, that, that's one of the best parts. What's the very end of verse 17? No, no, no. That's verse 18. Verse 17. Go verse, go verse back. <laughs> yes! Oh my gosh! <laughs> the people obeyed God. They did what he said. And look what happened. Remember what they said back in verse 11, what Nehemiah and Ezra told the people, the joy of the Lord is your strength. We come down to verse 17. There is obedience and revival, and there was great rejoicing. Hmm! <sighs> Oh my goodness! <sighs> Gotta roll up my sleeves. I am, I am hot. Oh my goodness! <sighs> I am sorry, guys. This is just so cool. <laughs> and then look, there, there's obedience happening. But then beyond that, they they see that the elders, the leaders of each tribe or each of the families, have found this thing, this command of God for them to, to do. And they're like, oh my goodness, who knows what else that God is asking us to do? You know, what else might we be missing out on? Because we had, yeah, Ezra and his boys read to us for six hours, but that's not enough to get through everything. There's so much more. And so what happens? Day by day, from the first day to the last day of the Feast of Booths, Ezra read to them from the book of the law of God. Every day. <laughs> Get a throat lozenge for that scribe. <laughs> Man, if ever there was a need for a microphone and, and like a good PA system, that was it. Oh, but could you just picture that atmosphere? Revival just running rampant throughout God's people. They are thirsty. They are, the you know, 
absolutely. Somebody said hunger earlier when we were talking about wanting God. Just the hunger that they had. It's like, we want to obey God. How cool is this? All the stuff that we've read about, about you know, the Jews. You know, we went through the book of Judges. Oh, what a drudgery that was. Oh, that was painful. But here we are, and it's and it's just the most refreshing thing. This is like if this if 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 the Bible was like a, a thriller, uh, or or you know or or some sort of you know fiction novel. This is this this is exactly what you read for. This is this is the moment that is the payoff of all the pain and all of the turmoil. When then people are like, we want to pursue God. And And, you know, it's even better because they're not – the Bible, you know, Leviticus doesn't say anything about reading the law as throughout the days of the, of, of the feast. They're just doing that organically because they want to find out what else God said. Oh, my goodness. My internet. <laughs> I'm going to try and – Okay, we'll try that. Oh. No, no, that's definitely my internet. That's all 18 verses of chapter 8, guys. I know I'm 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 like nuts like excited and I